Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 4th, 2016, and before introducing today's guest, I want to share with you the results of the survey of your favorite episodes of 2015. I want to thank all of you around the world, and you live in 65 different countries, who responded, uh, particularly your general comments and feedback. Those comments were very helpful for me in thinking about ways to make econ talk better, and I very much enjoyed hearing how econ talk has been useful or educational for you. It's very gratifying, and I thank you for listening and for sharing. I also want to thank Katie Damour, who's a new addition to the Econ Talk team, who's been helping me with links and the descriptions for each episode. We're looking for new ways to make Econ Talk more valuable to you, and econtalk.org, our website, has some great resources for additional learning or to engage with other listeners through the Econ Talk extras that you'll find there. Now, here are your favorite episodes from 2015. Number 10, Canis Prendergast on how prices can improve a food fight and help the poor. Number nine, Nicholas Vincent on the Magna Carta. Number eight, Brian Nozick on the Reproducibility Project. Number seven, Michael O'Hare on art museums. Number six, Michael Munger on choosing in groups. Number five, Michael Munger on Econ Talk's 500th episode. Number four, David Scarbeck on prison gangs and the social order of the underworld. Number three, Wences Casares on Bitcoin and Zappo. Number two, Philip Tetlock on super forecasting. And the number one episode for 2015, uh, according to your votes, your most popular episode was Matt Ridley and climate change, which got about 20 percent, just short of 20 percent of the vote. So one in five of you put that in your top five. So it is appropriate that today's guest is Matt Ridley, science writer and member of the House of Lords. His latest book is The Evolution of Everything, How New Ideas Emerge. Matt, welcome back to Econ Talk. Russ, it's great to be back on the show, and I'm delighted to have uh, come out on top of that uh, poll. It's great that a lukewarmer can still be at the top. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> your views are lukewarm, but uh, you still generate a lot of enthusiasm. The, the, the extreme moderation is my view. Exactly. Now, your book, which is uh, quite ambitious, is about the evolution of everything, which is about as ambitious as something can get, I guess. Uh, it's about emergent order, a, a favorite topic here on our program, and how uh, life and everything within it evolves. Give us a brief definition of how you see emergence and its evolution. Uh, well, I would like to start by uh, uh, acknowledging my debt to um, both Russ Roberts and Don Boudreau uh, for their incredibly insightful blogs, essays, podcasts, and everything else, which I have uh, learned an enormous amount from over the years. And as you say, uh, emergence is very much a theme. Uh, spontaneous order is very much the, the, the theme of what, what uh, you and Don write about. Uh, and uh, so I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've relentlessly plagiarized some of your best ideas in this book, I'm sorry to say. But then that's kind of the one of my arguments in the book is that we're all um, – uh, gradually adding to each other's ideas and the whole thing is cumulative and gradual uh, rather than being um, going in the, in, the, in the way of sort of jumps and so on. Well, thank you for that appreciation. I, I have to, I'd like to say you're standing on the shoulders of giants, but as, as my listeners know, I'm only 5'6", but go ahead. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of intellectual giants. Um, the uh, gist of the book is that the theory of evolution by natural selection, the uh, emergence of complexity and uh, sophisticated fit between form and function, which, uh, but by a, an undirected mechanism, which Charles Darwin discovered in 1859, applies to a lot of other things than just bio biology. It applies to a lot of other things than just genetic systems. Uh, it's the best way of describing how society changes, how culture changes, how the economy emerges, how uh, uh, technology progresses. Uh, and therefore, what I'm trying to do is, is uh, 
erect a general theory of evolution to go alongside the special theory of evolution that Charles Darwin came up with. Um, and uh, if you like, I, I therefore reach back further than Darwin and say the whole Enlightenment project, particularly when Adam Smith gets hold of it in 1759, exactly 100 years before Darwin gets hold of it in 1859, it is to recognize that most of the important things happen in the world that happen in the world happen spontaneously and produce complex order and produce a fit between form and function, but that we have made the mistake over uh, many centuries of whenever we see something complex, assuming someone's in charge and assuming that it had to be designed by a, a central intelligence of some kind. Uh, and that's so. So uh, I, I have to be a little careful. I mustn't be too procrustean and try and fit absolutely everything in the world to, to my theory. But I have a go at doing that. Yes, and, you do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and in a sense, what I'm saying is, look, let's see how far we can take this idea. Because of course, there are moments when I have to fall back and say, well, yes, you know, somebody did that. You know, Hitler had an effect on history. He wasn't just a symptom of history. He was also someone who changed history. So, uh, you know, I am of course prepared to concede that uh, that there is uh, intelligent design or unintelligent design in the case of Hitler um, in the world, uh, but an awful lot of what happens, we overestimate the impact of, of centralized direction and top-down thinking. Now, in general, I, I couldn't agree more, although I found a number of things in the book that uh, I disagreed with. We will, we'll get to some of those, but I want to start with the human side. Uh, the biological side is a little... Um, more well known on the human side, we often talk about the economy being emergent, but you go way beyond that. And I, I want to talk uh, first about culture. Uh, how is culture emergent, and to what extent does it get uh, steered or not? Well, uh, there's a theory of cultural evolution now, which is really relatively sophisticated. Uh, Rob Boyd, Pete Richardson, and Joe Henrik are the, the, the main leaders in this field, uh, and and they have. Um, pointed out that uh, actually the best way of describing how culture changes is by talking about it being something that's gradual, something that comes from the interactions of many individuals rather than the, the decisions of, of two or three leaders. Uh, and in particular, they've modeled this and said, look, um, so long as people are uh, um, copying each other with imperfections, um, then you will get a form of sort of spontaneous evolution happening. Uh, that 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 it's uh, you don't have to have um, you know perfect digital bytes of information like you get in genomes. Uh, you don't have to have um, a very faithful replication uh, of ideas for there to be an effective competition between ideas that ends up with some taking over from others. And if you look at the history of culture, it is one of of gradual change in which uh, uh, the, the the people in charge of society um, are actually reflecting the mood of, of ordinary people rather than directing it uh, much more often than, than we think. Let me give you a, a very concrete example because I've been speaking in rather abstract terms the last couple of minutes. Um, uh, and that is the changing attitudes towards, say, homosexuality. Uh, now, in my lifetime, it's gone from being an illegal act to being quite the reverse, something that, that you can even have uh, gay marriage uh, uh, under the law. Um, I would argue that it's pretty clear that every legal change, every change that, that happened in politics, whether it's the legalization of homosexuality or the legalization of gay marriage, was a reflection of the way society was changing, not a cause of the way society was changing. It was a symptom of, of society rather than a cause. Uh, in other words, you know, tolerance of homosexuality emerged among ordinary people before politicians decided to act and make it emerge. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of things. Um, racism would be another example. Uh, correct. Th there are many. Here, here's the challenge I have for you, which is overlaying your view of emergence as, as I would say – quote, the right way to think about most things, and I agree with you there, you often argue in the book that it's also a good thing, that emergence is a good thing, that 
this uncontrolled process leads to progress, for example, in economics, which I, I agree with. But the problem I have is that in economics, one of the reasons I think it leads to progress is that there are these feedback loops of profit and loss, of customer satisfaction, of freedom to shop where you want that help encourage suppliers to work harder, do better, innovate, and so on. It's not as clear that those feedback loops very well work very well in the case of culture. So racism, to take an example, can persist for centuries, millennia. Uh, it's emergent. No one's in charge of it. No one's in charge of the idea that, that we should look down on certain skin colors or ethnic groups or religious beliefs or sexual practices. But it's emergent, and there's nothing progressive about it in particular. It's uh, – and of course, at the time, people thought it was um, not just benign but – uh, not just n uh, not harmful, but the right way to think about things. Do you think we make progress in morality and in culture, or uh, is it merely just adaptive to the attitudes of its time and, and swims around like, like many species do? Well, my answer to that um, goes back to my previous book, which was The Rational Optimist, where I, I identified, not for the first time and not uniquely, but I, I nonetheless zeroed in on the fact that we have seen extraordinary progress. Uh, in human uh, uh, economic situations, like, you know, living standards, but also in culture. Uh, and, of course, Stephen Pinker has chronicled this in, in respect to violence, the, the decline of violence over the last few hundred years. So whether you like it or not, the fact is that progress has more often been in a beneficial than a, than a bad direction over the last hundred years or so. Now, why is that? Why would I, why would I claim that a that an evolutionary system is more likely to produce positive results than negative results. You're absolutely right, of course, about racism, that, that, you know, that we've seen periods of history where uh, emergent phenomena have appeared which are bad things. Uh, I mean, I, to, to your example of racism, I would add, for example, the, the period in the early 20th century when a lot of countries drifted towards dictatorships. Uh, and I actually think that technology had a part to play in that because of the, the role of radio in, in allowing demagoguery and so on. Um, so, yes, evolution can certainly go in a bad direction in human society. Why am I claiming that net it, it has tended to go in a good direction and therefore we should be not frightened of it and not, uh, and, and, and let it happen mostly rather than uh, frantically try and jump on its back and, and drive it in a certain direction? Why am I claiming that? Well, because evolution is a theory of mutation and selection of spontaneous change, some of which gets kept and some of which gets rejected. And it seems to me that uh, we are the agents of selection as individuals uh, in this process. And, uh, you know, if you think about, say, whether or not a, a, a you know, a, a genre of art uh, persists, it's because people have selected it, have said, yes, we like that, and we don't like that. So there is, and, and, and there's no reason for people to select things they don't like. And on the whole, people don't like violence or um, unpleasantness. They, they like nice things. So there, there, there is a bias towards us picking uh, the good things. Now, you might say I've suddenly thrown away my... Um, belief in bottom-upness and gone for a top-down selection process. Yeah, you know, we're allowing lots of different ideas and trial and error, and then we're suddenly picking the things we like and not the things we don't like. But who's we in this? Uh, it's everybody. It's uh, the great bulk of people. It's an anti-elitist message that I'm trying to deliver here a lot of the time. In other words, I think it's not uh, the, you know, it, it's very hard to identify a case where a certain style of art or music became popular and persisted in human society because some ruler said he liked it, rather than because ordinary people decided they liked it. I think that's what I'm saying. But as I say, I, you know, the, a lot of this is quite exploratory, and I'm, I'm prepared to be to, to have counterexamples thrown at me to make me rethink as I go along. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not trying to have the very last word on this stuff in this book. Well, let's talk about language for a minute, which is an example you use, example I've used, we've talked about here in Econ Talk. Um, if I come up with a clever phrase, um, 
and other people hear it and like it, it can get repeated through word of mouth and it it can catch on. And we don't really have a an understanding of who the first person uh, who existed who used Google as a verb. Probably many people at once thought it was a useful thing and it just immediately, I suspect, caught on to mean uh, used a search engine called Google or even often not a search engine called Google, but became a generic term. But there are lots of things in English that would be nice to change. You know, just to take one silly example, the word debt, D-E-B-T, it's probably better to spell it without the B. If I do that, I look illiterate. Uh, people assume I made a typo. And so a lot of things persist in English that are very flawed, lots of duplicate words, uh, you know, homonyms, confusing things, grammatical weirdnesses. English is incredibly complicated in a not very good way of complex. And yet they persist. And so my view of English is it's it's pretty good. It's shockingly good given that it isn't steered. But I don't have any – and there are some feedback loops. So if I use useful, clever phrases or shorter contractions, people might you start using them without the approval of a, of a committee or a board of experts. But – in morality, it's a lot harder – in culture generally, it's a lot harder to see where the feedback loops are that encourage us to do something that has an effect beyond me, which is, of course, what we really are interested in, not just the local changes that inter that benefit us. That's – we understand. But the overall evolution of an entire culture in one direction or another, you know, whether it's the length of a woman's skirt, whether men wear hats – whether uh, men have to tuck their shirts in or wear ties. These are things that I'm not sure they're, they're really useful feedback loops that help us move, quote, forward. I don't know what forward is. So I, I'm just a little yep. more skeptical in those areas. Well, that, there's a lot of things I want to respond to in that. And uh, and it was a very, very rich uh, question. If, well, maybe it was more of an answer than a question. But anyway, it was a, it was a rich, uh, rich little uh, um piece of text you, you just delivered there in the English language, of course. And, and of course, all of what we're talking about goes back, as you know better than almost anybody, uh, to Adam Smith here, because not only did he write a very fine and important essay on language, uh, but he then wrote a, uh, a groundbreaking book on morality, um, the um, uh, theory of moral sentiments. Uh, and uh, and and he describes and I want to come back to the language example in a minute, but let let me park that on one side and and just answer your last the last part of your question about morality. He describes what I think is rather a good feedback loop. He talks about how the impartial spectator sort of stands for your and my discovery of how our behaviour um, is responded to by other people. Um, uh, uh, and in other words, um, as I grow up, I calibrate my behavior according to what other people consider to be good or bad. Uh, I find out that uh, killing someone uh, is disapproved of in society, I, and, and I therefore uh, try not to do that, <laughs> to put it at its bluntest. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, what's so revolutionary about Adam, Adam Smith saying this, and I probably got this from you, actually, uh, is is uh, that he's saying, uh, actually, we're not getting this stuff from priests. Priests are just reflecting back to us what we've agreed are the rules of moral behavior in society. Uh, we're getting uh, we're, we're getting this from from literally our the reactions of other people to how we behave. And in one society, people can react by saying, good for you, you killed that man who looked at your wife. Uh, that's an honorable thing to do. That's a very moral thing to do. And you learn that that's what morality is. And in other societies, you, you, you learn that, no, however badly someone has behaved towards you, you never kill them. Uh, and in fact, you're an outcast if you do, so don't go that way. Uh, and so, um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, Smith is, is talking about a, a, a feedback loop into the way we respond to behavior that produces uh, moral codes. Uh, and priests then come along and say, actually, the only reason you're not killing people is because uh, Jesus Christ told you not to kill people. Um, and uh, and we go, oh, is that right? Well, we didn't realize that. And I think that's a mistake. We'll come on to the religious question later, I'm sure. But can I just go back to the language point? Sure. Because uh, you 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 touched on this but didn't dr drill into it. And I think one of the most powerful ways of 
getting people to think about evolution as the right way of thinking about cultural change is to talk about language um, because it falls into a category for which we don't have a good word. And again, I think I got this straight from you. <laughs> I'm just telling back to you what, what you've taught me, Ross. Ross yeah, anyway. Do what I can. <laughs> uh, um, and, and Adam Ferguson, a contemporary of Adam Smith, uh, came up with this rather nice phrase where he said, there are things in the world that are the result of human action, but not the result of human design. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very obvious that a, you know, a, a pen is the result of human design. A thunderstorm is not the result of human design or action. But the English language is a result of human action. It's clearly man-made in that sense. And yet it's clearly not designed. No one's in charge of it. No one invented it. It emerged spontaneously. And we don't have a good vocabulary to describe such things. And yet they're everywhere when you think about it. You know, the economy is a good example as well. But, but, but language is a beautiful example. It's got a fit between form and function. It's highly complex. It's got rules. There are rules that you and I use in language that we don't even know about. I use the example in, in the book that uh, the commoner a word is, the less likely it is to change its meaning. Um, the commoner a word is, the, 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 the more it's likely to shorten um, uh, and become abbreviated, uh, or vice versa. The more it gets abbreviated, the more likely we are to use it. Uh, and, you know, so these are rules you and I are obeying, and yet they're rules that were never, you know, they, the, there was no lawgiver that wrote these rules. We came up with these rules among ourselves through some kind of feedback loop. Now, it doesn't involve a price mechanism, as you're, you're right in saying, but isn't that the answer to your question? That's where the feedback loops lie, the re our reactions among ourselves to the way we, 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 let, we let culture change? Well, there are feedback loops. I just think they're very um, imperfect. An example would be the example I gave of debt, dropping the B. I get a, neg I get a feedback loop, don't do that. Oh, uh, well, yes, but on that, 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 that I, I love that kind of example uh, because it's a, a living fossil. Uh, it's a vestigial uh, form. It's like, a, a, you know, the appendix in your in your uh, uh, intestinal canal or, or your little toe, neither of which nowadays have a function. You don't use your little toe for grasping fruit in the trees um, uh, in a way that uh, your ancestor may have done. Um, but it's still there. It's kind of left over. And, and there are things about the human body that are mistakes that evolution can't get around because it left them in that, so the fact that your retina is facing backwards, the light has to go through the nerves to get to the light sensitive cells, which is a mistake that's not repeated in, um, for example, the octopus, but it is repeated in, it is found in all vertebrates. And it's simply impossible to get rid of that. So, so the B is a, the B in debt is a, uh, is, is, is a living fossil. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a sign that we're dealing with, uh, uh, we're dealing with an evolutionary system, not a design system. If you'd designed it, you wouldn't have put a B in it. Right, and we can't fix it. We could fix it. It just that it's, and it might get fixed over a few hundred years, just like lots of words have changed their spelling. But uh, a bad uh, a vendor who sells rotten fruit doesn't last very long. That gets weeded out by a much more effective feedback loop. That's that's all I'm saying. But yeah. I think the more challenging that's case, true. the more challenging case. That's not so important to start with, uh, and it's that's one of the reasons it doesn't get fixed. An extra B is not a an enormous burden. It's think, a cheap, yeah, mistake. Yeah, I around. think the bigger problem is that is that morality writ large, and let's come back to that because I think it's it's more interesting. Um, morality writ large is much harder to fix at the global level. So I'll give you an example and open up another. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's a Pandora's box or a can of worms. You'll tell me when I'm done, but. Um, <laughs> You're very. Uh, I like your Adam Smith point, obviously, because you know, as as you know, and I'm, I'm interested in Smith. And Smith clearly is trying to show in the theory of moral sentiments that you don't need. I shouldn't say you don't need. Smith is trying to say in the theory of moral sentiments that our conscience, our sense of right and wrong, comes from ourselves, meaning those around us, not from necessarily from God, not necessarily from our parents, our our, our upbringing, and so. Uh, but it doesn't answer the question of where those opinions of others comes from. It's a little bit of a circular system. And as you point out, there can be cultures where 
it's okay to kill people. In fact, it's considered admirable and heroic and for all kinds of reasons. And Smith has to fall – not Smith because he doesn't write about this, I think, but Hayek does. Hayek has to argue then that cultures that honor life – Smith talks about it a little bit. I should I should put a footnote there. But Hayek argues that cultures that have better rules about norms that develop, that emerge, are going to dominate other cultures. And that's kind of true, but it's that's a very – Weak feedback loop, not just because it takes a lot of time, but because the competition between cultures, between cities, between nations, between hemispheres is not like the competition among uh, retailers and say uh, between Walmart and Target. It's just it's it's not as quote mistakes can easily be made and it might not even be easy to measure what is a mistake. So that's that's the challenge I have there. Yeah, I, this, this may not be the point you're driving at, but I, I, I have a reflection on that, which is that there's, there's a live debate in uh, biological evolution between group selectionism and uh, individual or gene selectionism. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the idea goes that, that some people have tended to say, well, actually what's happening in human beings is that groups live and die at the expense of other groups. Uh, and that that's the real driver of evolutionary change, particularly in, in human beings and indeed in some other species too. Whereas other people say, no, your main rival is the guy within your own society who's just living across the road and starting up a rival business. It's not a Frenchman um, uh, when you're an Englishman or, or a Chinese man if you're an American or something. Uh, and so the, the, the life and death of whole societies at the expense of other societies does happen but it's a it's a a smaller and rarer effect than the life and death of a business, a family, uh, a uh, uh, an idea um, uh, that, that uh, within a society in competition with other ideas within that society. So I think it's important not to get sidetracked by the the problem of of whole societies having to come and go. And I think that was Hayek's mistake. He he came in to this at a time when biological evolutionists were talking much too much about species competing with other species rather than the individuals within a species competing with other individuals within that species. Well, both are going on, right? It's just, I just Correct. think the, to borrow a phrase from Smith, the connection between quality and outcome between societal competition is, quote, loose, vague, and indeterminate. It's not as uh, reliable and obvious and actionable as it is at the micro level. So, Let's put that to the side. Let me turn to a different question related to morality, which is uh, your book's relentlessly critical of religion and belief in God. It's a sub-theme that runs through it. And although Smith argues that our conscience comes from those around us, uh, he doesn't rule out the possibility of God. And I would argue that Hayek, another – our modern champion of the ideas in your book uh, – was a believer that morality did have an enormous uh, reliance on religion. I'm going to quote him and, and ask for your response uh, because you view it as, as, a, as a negative or at least a, as a sort of non-irrelevance in, in, in the emergence of morality. So Hayek said the following, like it or not, we owe the persistence of certain practices and the civilization that resulted from them in part to support from beliefs which are not true – or, via, or verifiable or testable in the same sense as our scientific statements and which are certainly not the result of rational argumentation. They did help their adherents to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And I'm continuing quoting Hayek. Even those among us like myself who are not prepared to accept the anthropomorphic conception of a personal deity ought to admit that the premature loss of what we regard as non-factual beliefs – would have deprived mankind of a power, powerful support in the long development of the extended order that we now enjoy. And that even now, the loss of these beliefs, whether true or false, creates great difficulties. So your book is a, is a counterpoint to that. Why do you disagree with it? Mm, yeah. Well, basically because I think the that case has not been made. Uh, in other, that is a very, very common view that uh, that, that on the whole, we would have become as moral as we are less rapidly if we hadn't had supernatural beliefs, uh, essentially, to, to put it at its bluntest. Um, and that's an extremely widespread view to this day, and it's, it's 
Hayek thinks that, and and, uh, and 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 my problem with that is 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 twofold. One, I simply can't see the 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 dispassionate evidence for it. Uh, I mean, sure, uh, religions have um, been promulgators of morality in recent centuries. Before that, they weren't, frankly. You know, uh, very few religions were really saying anything moral um, uh, for, for, for large chunks of history, and, and or rather were saying a lot of immoral things as well, like, uh, you know, um, uh, beat up your rival religions and so on. Um, uh, so, it, you know, it's possible that absent a, a supernatural reason for believing in morality, people wouldn't have uh, have, have got there as quickly. Um, I'm just not myself convinced that, that there's any good evidence for that because we've had we've had so many centuries when religion has taken the credit for morality. Um, relentlessly uh, that that we can't really get behind the veil and find out whether that that explanation is true now i will certainly concede that religion is a lot nicer now than it was uh, you know in the time of the old testament you know you've only got to read the bible or, or in the early years of, of islam um but i i also uh, my view on this has got a lot less benign since the turn of the millennium uh, as I see religion being used to justify truly awful crimes again and again and again um, in this uh, the last two decades, um, one religion in particular more than more than others, uh, and um, while I you know uh, uh, I'm, I'm pre- and at the same time I'm simply motivated to, to say well. Uh, actually, I also want to know whether these supernatural beliefs are true or not. Uh, and if you go back to biology, you find that these supernatural beliefs got in the way of seeing a spontaneous order explanation for the world and fought it very, fu- you know, furiously and 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 uh, really quite uh, intolerantly for a long time. Uh, and you know, therefore, I'm I'm inclined to the view that I want to give the, the null hypothesis that we can do better with reason uh, than with unreason uh, and that we don't need um, uh, religion to be moral, um, I, I want to give that idea a chance. It's not as if the past 2,000 years of uh, when, when religion dominated almost every society on earth have been wonderful, peaceful ones that we'd be giving up. I think we might be able to achieve greater peace and greater um, generosity of spirit without it. I mean, I've answered your question in a very sort of umbrella, big historical way, but I could answer it in a different way and drill down, and maybe we'll we'll get a chance to do that. There's a lot, and we could spend two or three hours uh, talking just about this issue because it's so so fascinating. I'm I'm a religious believer. I'm a religious Jew. uh, In the book, is somewhat discomforting. I I would say more strongly that we live in a time, uh, I can't, in my lifetime, there's never been a time like today where religion is seen with such disdain and disrespect by intellectual elites. So it's it's fascinating Mm -hmm. to me to feel that, uh, to read that in your book. Uh, And of course, I push back against it emotionally while I'm reading the book. But just one comment uh, on this point about morality, and then I want to move on. We'll, maybe, we'll come back to religion, I'm sure. I've got a couple more points to, I want you to, to respond to, but just to stick with morality for a minute, you suggested earlier that morality was emergent, that religion responded to moral uh, trends in society, whether towards sexual practices, racism, et cetera. And yet, you know, when we go back to um, go back to the Bible, uh, love your neighbor as yourself is kind of a radical idea. Uh, it's in the Old Testament. It's wasn't, I don't think, the common view of people of the day. So while I concede the ugliness of much of human history and certainly the many things have been done, ev- evil things have been done in the name of religion, there are many things in religion that I think do underpin much of our modern morality. But whether I could prove that or not to your satisfaction, of course, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, well, exactly. That that would be my response. Is uh, yes, love your neighbour as yourself is a great invention uh, as an idea. 
But was it an invention of ordinary people trying to get along with each other, or was it a, an invention of priests saying, because of Zeus or, Z- or Yahweh or someone, this is a, a good way to behave? Uh, that would uh, I, I suspect neither of us could produce um, decent evidence to support our case um, uh, to, to support that. I think you know that that, that kind of question is lost in the mists of time, True. Um, which which means that um, yeah, it, it's entirely possible that that were you and I able to get in a in a time machine and go back, we could find really good evidence for your hypothesis. Um, <laughs> I uh, I doubt it, but. It's it's entirely possible. But it, it was a radical idea, and I'm going to use that as a segue to um, one of the more interesting parts of the book is your view of history and entrepreneurship, uh, history and technology, history and innovation, where you uh, criticize the so-called great man theory. I explain what that theory is and why you disagree with it, especially in regards to innovation, where I think a lot of people are very – romantic about that. I'd probably put myself in that group. So uh, I found your book to be a, a bit of a, um, uh, an a educator. Damp- no. no, an educator. <laughs> I, li- I really like that part of your yeah. of your contrary yeah. nature. Go ahead. Exactly. Well, it, it, like you, I, I, my, my, my emotional self wants there to be, you know, wonderful, famous people who change history and invent things and discover things and are, you know, are sort of demigods. And I love reading stories about them. And, and, you know, I love reading biography and I'm fascinated by great figures of history. But, uh, the, the argument that, that, that raged in the 18th century and on into the 19th century between two schools of thought about history, that there were that history was made by great men. Uh, let's leave the fact that they left women out of the story at that point um, uh, uh, on one side uh, versus the theory that actually we're overemphasizing great men, that the great men are symptoms of the times rather than um, authors of, of the changes they lived through. And um, in the 18th century, uh, Denis Diderot in particular and the other stars of the French Enlightenment fought back against this way of telling history as King X did this to King Y and, uh, you know, such and such a priest came and changed the world, etc. and said, actually, it's not like that. It's ordinary people who are driving historical changes. And sure, occasionally one of them emerges and becomes their leader, but uh, he's as much the the effect as the cause. Um, and so the, the example I give in the book of this is that if you, the, the, in the great encyclopedia that the French Enlightenment uh, uh, stars produced, uh, Diderot and d'Alembert in particular in the 18th century, they refused to put any biographical entries in that whole book. I love that. So if, <laughs> if you want to read Isaac Newton's biography, and they have a very – sorry, they do have a very good biography of Isaac Newton in the encyclopedia, but it's not listed under Newton. It's listed under Wolfthorpe, which is the – village he was born in <laughs> and it's a sort of joke in a way that they're doing that yeah, but they're, sure. they're making they're, they're trying to make a point carlisle comes along in the uh, in the um early 19th century and said you've got to be joking come on look what napoleon did that was a great man uh you know great not sin- uh, he's not necessarily saying morally great but he's saying you know a man who, who changed his who, an influential man and after the 20th century it's hard not to agree that that great men can influence history um but lord acton said great men are mostly bad men and we have some pretty good examples of that in the 20th century um and and i so, so where the rubber hits the road for me on this is the the history of technology of discovery and invention and I'm very struck by something that I really got from um, uh, Kevin Kelly's book, um, uh, uh, What Technology Wants, where he in- introduced me to a whole literature on uh, on the simultaneous discovery phenomenon. The fact that pretty well every invention and discovery you 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 mention has occurred to two different people at roughly the same time, possibly three, possibly four. Um, my favorite example of this is the light bulb, uh, which uh, in my part of the world, a man named Joseph Swan gets the credit for inventing the light bulb and a terrible uh, fraud called Thomas Edison came along and uh, ripped him off. Um, well, if I live in Russia, I give the credit to Lodigin and I'm equally cross with Edison. But actually, if you drill down into history, in the 1870s, there are 23 people uh, in that decade alone, who deserve 
independent credit for coming up with the idea of the incandescent light bulb. It was an idea ripe to be discovered. It was inevitable that it would be discovered in that in that in that decade, and that's true of almost everything, you know. And, and of course, famously, you know, evolution itself, the idea of natural selection, occurs to Wallace and Darwin at the same time, and Darwin has to rush into print to prevent himself being preempted. Uh, uh, even relativity, you know, we tend to think of Einstein as unique and coming up with this idea that occurred to nobody else and that, that took the world by surprise and nobody believed him. Um, well, that's true, but if you look at what Hendrik Lorentz was doing at the same time, he was well on the trail. He'd have got there if Einstein had been run over by a tram. Um, the double helix of DNA, incredibly important discovery, big race going on to find it. The, the technology has reached the point when we're going to find the genetic code around that time. So there's a sort of complete dispensability of scientists and inventors that really surprises me when you think about it. Now, does, does that make mean that we, we don't admire them? No, in some ways we admire them more because they were in a race. They had to get there first, uh, if you like. And by the way, this doesn't apply nearly as well in the arts. So if, if Beethoven had failed to write yeah. the Ninth Symphony, nobody else would have done it. Yeah. Um, although there are genre, you know, musical genres that would have emerged. So, um, so I'm, I'm just trying to take, uh, to, 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 uh, I mean, partly I think, you know, we put these people on such a pedestal that it makes it hard for young people to think they could ever achieve this. And once you read the biography of, of, a, of a great scientist or a great general or something, you realize, well, there's a lot of chance and there's a lot of being in the right place at the right time uh, that got him where it was. It isn't all down to his godlike character. Um, so uh, I'm, I, I'm very much coming down on the anti-great man theory um, side of history, uh, though, of course, I can see that individuals can, can make a difference. I like the but, point. But, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. no, I was going to say, but, but, but the general point that technology would, would march along whoever's discovering it is, I think, a really interesting evolutionary one, and it, it makes, makes technological progress seem almost inevitable. And I, and I get a little bit mystical in this part of the book to, to the fury of some people who, who, who think that, uh, that I've, I've somehow uh, imbued technology with a, with a spirit or, or something, which is not my intention at all, because that would be a top-down explanation, if you see what I mean. No, I really liked your your observation that it's hard to think of, of inventions or products that came well before their time. Uh, I guess. Yes, I had this had this conversation with someone just the other day, and and uh, he he said I've got a really good example of that wheeled suitcases, and I said, funny, that's the example I thought of too. And when I looked it up, I discovered actually they came about the right time when airports got big and aluminium wheels got small, etc. Before that, there wasn't, and, and, and porters became rare. You know, before that, there wasn't really much point in putting heavy wheels on the suitcase. Anyway. And taking so up room go. that might otherwise be used for clothes. It's a, it's a, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a trivial example, but it's quite interesting, actually. Um, you know, the, um, uh, the personal data assistant, the so-called PDA, I think that's what D stands for, uh, the original Newton, which was the Apple product, which was really the first handheld device, was a failure. Uh, but no one took that to mean that it could never be done. And of course, right. sh quote, shortly after, not so shortly, but by historical standards, very shortly after, uh, a whole group of products came into being. The, the smartphone, uh, the, uh, the Palm Pilot, and other devices that were successful a few years later – was it because they were designed better? Was it they were more timely? I don't know, but it is interesting. Well, it was partly because because uh, um, uh, the density of chips uh, had, had shrunk even further, and therefore, or had increased even further, and therefore, um, you know, the the the, uh, the PDA had suddenly become really sophisticated enough to be useful, whereas before that, it was a pretty trivial device or whatever. Um, I, one of the one of the things I'm fascinated by, by the way, is the way in which. In this this phenomenon of inexorable, inevitable uh, invention is clearest in the digital world. I mean, nobody genuinely thinks that if Google hadn't been born, uh, we would have no search engines, right. for example. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, this is also the world in which we give most credit to the entrepreneurs who end up at the top of the tree. You know, uh, Bezos and, and Zuckerberg and, and Gates and, um, uh, of course, Jobs uh, end up 
with this sort of godlike status as if they've changed the world dramatically, whereas in fact, in some sense, they're, they're, the, they're the lucky ones. So I just, sorry, I don't mean to, 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 to deny their, their skill. Again, they were doing it in competition with others, which makes it an all the more impressive achievement. But it, it's rather ironic that in an industry where, where we're just inevitably discovering all these things, we, we, we're recreating this almost sort of imperial, or almost demigod-like status for um, uh, businessmen. It's it's a fascinating thing to think about. I the way I was uh, forced to think about it. You mentioned Johnny Ive in your book, the Apple designer. If if Steve Jobs had say um, taken a little more um, psychedelic drug. Uh, had had a little more psychedelic drug use in his youth <laughs> and had gone off to India and never been heard from again by the rest of the world, we might think that a Dell computer is the height of design elegance and a fantastic product, which it's, it is. It's a little bit like evolution in that way. Is that It's not perfect. It works really well for its circumstance. But it would be nice to have a more beautiful giraffe, perhaps, or a more beautiful desk laptop computer and the Mac is, I think, a little more beautiful than Adele, but yeah, I quite agree. I can remember where I was when I first saw. I can't remember which which Apple product it was, but you know, the one that was trying to look nice rather than trying to be functional, and that that really, I thought, it was weird. This is this is graceful. This is you know not the right way to do things. Computers shouldn't be treated in this frivolous way. I, I had some weirdly sort of negative reaction to it, which I can't now understand. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a tough question for a. Um evolutionary optimist as you are, um, why are our ideas and our meaning, those of us who are fans of leaving things relatively alone and letting things get steered by all of us rather than a few of us, why are our views so unpopular? Why aren't we sweeping the world? Why isn't free market capitalism uh, the dominant uh, economic system, and I know you could you could say, well, it is, but I'd say not really. I mean, the, the growth of government in the United States has been inexorable over the last eighty years, seventy years, and uh, those of us who think it should be a lot smaller, should we just give up, or we should we reexamine our views because they haven't been adopted? It's the same question as uh, Darwin faced. In other words, when he said, uh, "I don't think all this exquisite." Uh, fit between form and function that you get in the human body or in any other species or in an ecosystem comes from an intelligent designer. Everyone went, whoa, you can't say that. That's obviously wrong. I've never heard such a stupid thing. Of course there must be design. You know, these uh, these objects are beautifully designed, so there must be a designer. Um, it's sort of that same question. And uh, and pe people, people didn't just find, find it unpersuasive, they found it morally repugnant in some way. I don't fully understand why, but I think Dan Dennett gets closest to cracking this enigma when he talks about the intentional stance. Uh, so uh, we, we, we have a reflex assumption when we see something that it was designed, created, or planned rather than emergent and spontaneous. Uh, and we actually go too far in this direction. We think that thunderstorms are vindictive things, for example. Uh, you know, we, that either, you know, the witch doctor has organized for lightning to strike my house, um, or just, uh, you know, the, well, the, there's a phrase my father used to use after he'd hit his thumb with a hammer or something. He would say, oh, I hate the vindictiveness of inanimate objects. <laughs> and I can't remember where that comes from, but it's a, it's a quote from someone. And uh, do you know what I mean? It, uh, you, I'm sure you know the experience that, that, you know, you, how dare you make my life so difficult engine when you won't start or whatever it is. So we imbue agency to things that don't have agency. We imbue intentionality to things that clearly can't have intentionality. Why do we do this? Well, probably because it's better to err in that direction than in the opposite direction back in the Pleistocene Stone Age. If you get hit on the back of the head by a stone, um, to to say, oh, well, things happen, you know, um, that's just the way of the world, is not necessarily as sensible as to turn around and say, who threw that stone? Um, do you see what I mean? Sure. Uh, and so I think that's where it comes from, that, that, that we, we um, free market people are coming along saying, 
actually, you don't need to put someone in charge. Uh, you don't need to um, uh, for, for there to be a plan. Uh, this problem will get solved if we let people free to come up with solutions. Um, uh, that goes against our belief that the world is on the whole a planned and ordered and designed place. But of course, it also gets in the way of human ambition. I mean, you and I are effectively saying to someone, don't put me in charge, don't make me the, um, the czar in charge of policy on this area, uh, because I won't be able to do any good. Um, whoever said that, you know, if, you've got, if you're being offered the czar job uh, in Washington with a very large salary and a large staff working for you in a big corner office, who's going to turn that down? So w the, the modern version of the intentional stance is to, is to have a sort of belief that politicians can fix any problem. Yes, and we do like thinking we're important and powerful and certainly um, like being loved and lovely, as Adam Smith would say, or at least loved. Um, I'm going to read a longish quote from the book, um, which is very provocative, and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. Uh, you write the following. Bad news is man-made, top-down, purposed stuff imposed on history. Good news is accidental, unplanned, emergent stuff that gradually evolves. The things that go well are largely unintended. The things that go badly are largely intended. Let me give you two lists. First – the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the Versailles Treaty, the Great Depression, the Nazi regime, the Second World War, the Chinese Revolution, the 2008 financial crisis. Every single one was the result of top-down decision-making by relatively small numbers of people trying to implement deliberate plans, politicians, central bankers, revolutionaries, and so on. Second, the growth of global income, the disappearance of infectious diseases, the feeding of 7 billion, the cleanup of rivers and air, the reforestation of much of the rich world. The internet, the use of mobile phone credits as banking, the use of genetic fingerprinting to convict criminals and acquit the innocent. Every single one of these was a serendipitous, unexpected phenomenon supplied by millions of people who did not intend to cause these big changes. Now, I love that passage, but when I step back, I have to – I have big problems with it. And the first problem I have is that the First World War or the Versailles Treaty, even the Great Depression – those are – I see those as emergent also. They are the confluence of all kinds of influences and trends and schemes of individuals which often intent created the opposite of what they intended, just to pick one Woodrow Wilson example. Um, how should I think about those things? Why do you – how am I able to have a taxonomy with those as being so separate uh, from the so-called good things? Well, I, I would disagree just simply on the on, on the, the sort of historical evidence. And, and the First World War was quite fresh in my mind when I was writing this book because it was the, the 2014 centenary of, of it. Uh, and, and what was emerging for me from the books I was reading, Margaret Macmillan and other people, was was how, how relatively few people in the chancelleries of Europe made relatively few decisions that led to a complete catastrophe that nobody was expecting – and that the people were appalled by, uh, you know, I mean, the, the British people, for example, were completely focused on a sort of nasty situation in Ireland uh, right up until the end of August 1914, at which point they suddenly discovered that their leaders had dragged them into a war on, in continental Europe um, based on some commitments they'd made in some treaty with the French and the Russians against the Germans and the Austrians, uh, and that if... if um, uh, you know, Sir Edward Grey had said something different to Count von Moltke on some such occasion. We wouldn't have been there. And of course, famously, if if um, I've forgotten his name, the assassin at Sarajevo, had, had, Gavrilo um, Princep. Thank you, Gavrilo Princep had not, uh, uh, you know, taken a wrong turning <laughs> in the streets of Sarajevo and found himself right next to. No, it was the, it was the around, Crown yeah. Prince who took the wrong turning. Yeah, yeah exactly. But anyway. Um, uh, so, so I, I really did feel at that time that, that that, and indeed the Great Depression, based on the mistaken decisions essentially of central bankers in that case, um, uh, were were relatively few to many decisions rather than many to few. Um, and I came up with those lists quite easily. Now, of course, you can list counterexamples. You know, there are. Uh, there are phenomena in the world that, that come from the many to the few, 
that are bad, uh, and there are, uh, well, not from the many to the, from the many to the many, if you like, um, uh, and there are, you know, incredible individual decisions that, that result in, in good outcomes. Um, but on the whole, I'm impressed by how this ludicrously simple rule that I came up with <laughs> right at the end of the book, slightly provocatively, as you've spotted, yeah. um, uh, that that most of the good things that happen in history tend to be unplanned, um, whereas many of the bad things tend to be planned. Um, I'm impressed by how easy it is to defend that that point. Well, I guess the thought I'd have is that none of the people in those chancelleries before World War One intended World War One. They actually thought they were either making their country safer or leading to peace, and so I think they. I think World War One was very unplanned, but I do concede. Oh, that, oh, sorry. Yes, that's a perfectly good point. Yes, I hadn't thought of that. Yes, I do concede that they were smaller groups, and the idea, decentralization is a really good idea as a general yes. rule. Yes. Um, a related point, I think, is this. Um, you don't directly talk about this, but in a couple of places, you remark on the irony of someone being called right wing. You mentioned Hayek, and you could mention yourself. You could mention me. I've been called right wing. I'm sure you have. Um, why is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and well, there's a there's a fascinating historical trend here in that. Uh, I mean, I, did, I, I I'm very interested in the fact that in the in the the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, if you are a, a an economic liberal who believes in the free market, you're also a believer in the abolition of slavery and the uh, disestablishment of the church and yeah. uh, and all these kind of things. Um, uh, and 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 so you're very much a liberal in in every sense of the word. You you know you dislike the big state, you dislike monarchs, you dislike the the, the powerful church in in society. Um, and 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 right through. The first half of the 19th century, that's true, that, that economic liberals are also social liberals. By the time you get to the middle of the 20th century, something different has happened. And on the whole, um, uh, social liberals who want societal change and who are worried about the poor and things like that are by then believers in a big state. Now, how does that come about? At what point does uh, does the left if you like, because that's what we're talking about, suddenly say they want a big state, not a small state. Uh, and I think it's mostly Marx's fault. Uh, now, admittedly, I'm, there's a little bit of great man theory in there. <laughs> or, or rather, Marx is, let, let's say Marx is the symptom rather than the well, cause. But anyway, um, you know, the, there's a moment when suddenly the left says, actually, in economic terms, we want a big state. We want to own the means of production and so on. And you're left with these fascinating relics, uh, people like uh, Sir John Morley in Britain, um, uh, uh, a man named Ernest Benn, etc. Uh, there are other American examples uh, of, of people who are real old traditional liberals who are on the left socially, but they're also on, they're also free marketeers. Um, and they kind of peter out. The Strange Death of Liberal England was a book written about this phenomenon. Uh, and when free market, uh, free enterprise reemerges, it is championed by people who are basically social conservatives, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, etc. And the only way they can get a hearing for freedom and liberty in economics uh, is by appealing to the conservatism um, uh, on social issues of, of a large chunk of, of that audience. And, uh, you know, I have arguments with my good friend and colleague Tim Montgomery on the Times about this, who says, look, the, you libertarians are never going to get a majority vote unless you ally with some social conservatives. And that seems to me a pity because I don't want to be a social conservative. I want us to approve of gay marriage too and all that kind of thing. Um, so, in, in, and in what sense? You know, in, 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 if to an 18th century philosopher, to describe Russ Roberts or Matt Ridley as as right wing because they believe in freedom of people to not just believe and think and speak, but trade too. In what sense is that right wing? Right wing surely means you believe in in centralized authority, um, but somehow that's all got changed. Now, just I want to pick on two two themes that that I think of when I think about these issues. 
One is the progressive movement, which we haven't talked about, which is, I think, the dark side of, of the Enlightenment, the dark side of the rise of rationality and science, this belief, really a, a form of idol worship that human knowledge is uh, supreme and can solve all problems. Um, uh, rationality is deity, and I think that's part of what we're talking about in the, for the last 20 minutes and I think the other part, which I think we have to confront on our side, which we, I think, often ignore, is that too many people, unfortunately, conflate uh, being pro-free enterprise with pro-business. So whenever I can, yeah. I like to emphasize that I'm not pro-business. Um, I am in favor of the system that allows businesses to compete. And I think people who are skeptical of our views and our worldview, our philosophy, uh, say, well, in your view, which allows freedom, that just means that businesses are going to be free to exploit us. They either don't appreciate the power of competition or they don't think competition is very pervasive. And I think that latter concern is a legitimate one. I don't agree with it, but it's a legitimate concern that we don't do a very good job answering. And I think it causes us to be lumped in with the crony capitalists to, our, to my horror. Completely agree with everything you just said, and 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 wouldn't be able to uh, improve on it in, in, in a sense. Um, uh, and um, you know the idea that uh, I mean I, I sometimes use the phrase to describe myself I'm a free market anti capitalist because uh, the last thing I want is big capital um, to be in charge of the world. Uh, that's essentially a, a monopolistic way of approaching it. And you know where does a lot of these barriers to entry to new competition come from? They come from essentially government uh, doing the bidding of big business, um, and uh, that's. It's very hard to get that across because I think most people. I, I blame the education system that that most people are not given a free and fair uh, exposure to th this notion that that actually. Uh, you know, that Adam Smith was the ultimate anti-business person, if you like, anti-big business person anyway. For sure. Uh, I want to close with a philosophical thought. Your book is um, really about pushing what I would call the materialist or reductionist approach that is implicit in science to a much wider array of phenomena. Uh, and as, as a result, it's an incredibly provocative book. There are things that uh, you learn whether you want to or not. <laughs> there are things that you agree with and things you don't agree with. It's bristling uh, with ideas, which I think is the mark of a, of a great book. But one of the, I think, challenges of the philosophic, of the, excuse me, of the uh, materialist or reductionist approach is uh, a loss of, of mystery. Uh, I was, when I was reading your book, I was thinking of uh, Tom Stoppard in Arcadia when he says, the ordinary sized stuff, which is our lives, the things people write poetry about, clouds, daffodils, waterfalls, what happens in a cup of coffee when the cream goes in. These things are full of mystery, as mysterious to us as the heavens were to the Greeks. What he's trying to convey there is that there are things beyond our understanding. And to some extent, your book's pushing the idea that nothing's beyond our understanding. And I want to ask you, I want to challenge you. In modern philosophy, people like David Chalmers and Thomas Nagel have suggested – not suggested, they've argued very forcefully that consciousness itself is not amenable to the physical materialist reductionist approach. It's not just chemistry and that we will not understand it and that our current theories of biology can't explain it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I uh, strongly reject the view that uh, not understanding things makes them more wonderful than understanding them. Um, more awe-inspiring than understanding them, uh, and uh, you know that that, that character in uh, in Arcadia. Uh, I think it's Bernard. <laughs> it, it's inevitably Bernard, isn't it? He has some of the great lines, uh, and it's a wonderful play, and I love it. Um, uh, makes that point very, very well, but. Uh, you know, Richard Dawkins in Unweaving the Rainbow takes on exactly that and, and says when Keats criticizes Newton for unweaving the rainbow and telling us that um, it's actually made up of different uh, wavelengths of light, does he really make it any less wonderful, any less awe-inspiring? Do you now say, oh, it's a rainbow, I'm not going to look at it? Of course not. Um, and in fact, uh, quite the reverse. Science tells you, you know, that 
there, that we have deep geological time. We have four billion years of history on this planet. That we have a billion billion stars in the galaxy. That you know these are these are far more mind-boggling and awe-inspiring ideas than. Uh, we've got a black dome over our head with points of light which are being moved around by a, a, a man with a white beard called Zeus. You know, I, I just don't find that as exciting an explanation, if you like. I, okay, I'm reducing to absurdity a, a, a little bit. It's entertaining. But, uh, I agree with you, but it's entertaining. <laughs> so, so, so my view is that science, and I, I've made this, I mean, I, I, I hope to end up in the dictionary quotations for this one day because I've been saying it for 20 years and I, I think it's true and I probably stole it from someone else. Um, science is in the business not of getting rid of mysteries but of creating new mysteries. Uh, you know, every time it understands something, it creates a raft of new extraordinary problems to understand. It, crea it creates far more questions than it does answers. Quantum mechanics, for example, you know, We've got to the point of realizing that quantum mechanics must be true, but boy, does it boggle our minds, and can we really understand it? No. So um, so I would say that, that we materialist, rationalist, reductionist, uh, dreadful people are um, in the business of making wonder. Well, at the end of... Uh a little further along, I think, in Arcadia, it's probably Bernard again. He says, when we have found all the mysteries and lost all the meaning, we will be alone on an empty shore. That's the one counterpoint. <laughs> the other, I think the nice way to agree with what you just said is the, the Venetian proverb that Nassim Taleb quotes, the farther from the shore, the deeper the water. So as we learn more, we learn of what we don't know, which is another way right. of saying the mysteries keep keep going. But what about this consciousness thing? Do you have any thoughts oh, yeah. on that? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, 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 the, the, this is, I think it's, it's called mysterianism, the idea that, that consciousness may be too difficult for uh, the human brain to understand. Uh, so the human brain can exercise it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it can understand it. Um, uh, and Francis Crick, who spent the last 20 years of his life trying to understand consciousness, um, very, you know, took a relentlessly reductionist uh, approach. Uh, and he said, he said, look, when you look at an optical illusion and it switches from one view to another, you know, you know, those kind of things where you can either see it one way or you can see it another. Something's changed in your brain when you've switched from one to the other. Not, it doesn't moved, you know, a neuron hasn't changed place, but a pattern of firing of neurons in your brain is different now than it was a second ago. I want to find out what that is. And that will give me insights into uh, consciousness. Um, now, he never succeeded and no one else has succeeded. Um, but if we do get to the point where we succeed in that, where we can say, aha, I can actually see a pattern of activity in the brain that is different when not when you not when you've changed the image of someone's looking at but when we've changed their understanding of the image as it were um then we then have we removed all the mystery and excitement from consciousness no i don't think we have have we uh, uh, do we think that um we'll never get there i doubt it we thought life was going we couldn't get our heads around life you know right up until the mid 1950s people are saying well what what, what is the difference between living things and non-living things? We can't, I mean, I just can't imagine anything. Maybe it's quantum physics, people started saying. Uh, and then along comes Watson and Crick, and suddenly it, it falls into place. Digital coded information is what makes life different from non-life. Uh, nobody, nobody predicted that. Uh, it came completely out of left field. It came from an area of science that was thought to be completely irrelevant to the subject. Uh, so it could the same could happen in consciousness, but I certainly wouldn't bet against us being able to understand consciousness at some point in your or my lifetime. My guest today has been Matt Ridley. His book is The Evolution of Everything. Matt, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me on the show. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. 
Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.